Welcome, everybody. We are so excited to have you here uh, at our um, panel on DC statehood. My name is Monica Hopkins. I am the executive director of the ACLU of the District of Columbia. Um, I'm just going to do some brief introductions of our panelists today, and then we're going to dive right into our conversation. Um, Jamal Holtz is a DC statehood advocate. He was born and raised here in the District of Columbia in the wonderful Ward 8. Uh, he is a lead advocate for 51 for 51 and a commissioner on the DC Mayor's Commission on Juvenile Justice Reform. We have with us Andrea Young, the executive director of the ACLU of Georgia a proud Georgia native uh, and uh, an attorney, activist, and author. She has devoted her career to defending and extending civil and human rights. Most recently, she was an adjunct professor, professor at the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University, where she served for many years um, as the executive director of the Andrew J. Young Foundation and work to preserve and advance the legacy of her father, a former Atlanta mayor, civil rights leader, U.S. congressman, and U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. And finally, we have with us George Derek Musgrove, who is an associate um, professor um, who teaches courses on post-World War II United States history with an emphasis on African-American politics and he is the co-author uh, of Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital, and is currently working on a web-based map of the Black Power Movement in Washington, DC. Um, we are really glad to have all of you with us today. I, I'm gonna start with you, Derek, um, given your expertise on race and democracy and the history of Washington, D.C. Um, your insights are kind of invaluable to this conversation. Can you walk us briefly through the role you see race playing in the lack of D.C. statehood? Sure. The, the, I think the best way to answer your question is to break up the governance of the District of Columbia into three broad periods. And the first one, you know, roughly stretches from the signing of the Constitution to the start of the Civil War. And during that period, race doesn't play any role in the governance of the, of the District of Columbia because black folks are banned from voting in the District of Columbia. Race plays a huge role during that era in the placement of the District of Columbia. There was a deal struck between some of the founding fathers to make sure that the capital was going to be in the South. Uh, and it was placed on the, at the confluence of Potomac and Anacostia rivers as a way to sort of protect slavery, quite frankly, and to keep it out of the very anti-slavery uh, communities in Philadelphia. Um, but when it came to voting, uh, when it came to representation in Congress, that was primarily just an oversight of the sixth Congress, which voted on the Organic Act, which set up a government for uh, the federal district. Um, and, and race didn't play a role because they, most of the people voting on that legislation didn't see black people as citizens who had voting uh, power. Um, and and so, we'll, so we'll move past that. Um, and by the way, during that period, DC had home rule, it had mayors, it had uh, aldermen, uh, and all of them were white and many of them were slave owners. Um, and then of course the civil war occurred and fundamentally changed the nature of citizenship in the United States of America. Um, and DC was often a testing ground for many of the innovations that Republican Congress people implemented across the South. Uh, and so for instance, DC was the first place uh, to ban slavery in 1862. It was the first place to grant African-American men the right to vote in 1866, going into early 1867. Um, and black folks flooded onto the rolls here in DC and were able to uh, be decisive in helping to elect the first couple of mayors that we had uh, after the Civil War. Um, they passed anti-discrimination legislation. African-Americans started holding office. And a lot of local white Democrats, because DC was a Southern Democratic city before the war, got very uncomfortable. Uh, and so they worked, began working with racist reactionaries in Congress to not just strip African Americans of the vote in Washington, DC, uh, but to strip everyone of the vote 
Uh, they basically said if black people are going to vote in D.C., we'd rather that no one vote in D.C. And so in 1874, the city lost the ability to vote for anyone, for anything, even dog catcher. Uh, and in 1874, once that vote is taken away, uh, it remains taken away. We do not have a local government until 1974. Uh, there are many efforts over that period to try and bring the vote back, and almost all of them uh, are stymied by the politics of race. Uh, people effectively say in the 1890s, in the 1930s, in the 1950s, if you bring the vote back to Washington, D.C., black people will vote, and that is dangerous. Um, even when we got the presidential vote for the 23rd Amendment in 1960, you'd have reporters from Washington, D.C. going to the different state capitals where they were ratifying the amendment, and legislators would pull them aside. Hey, I heard that D.C. just got a black majority. Do we really want to be giving them the vote in the presidency? This is 1960, 1961, right? Um, and so the politics of race are core to keeping D.C. disfranchised for everyone for 100 years. And then the last thing I'll say is after 1974, during the modern home rule period, which, which we really fall into today, uh, race still plays a critical role in uh, the effort to make sure that we don't have a vote in Congress, because, of course, we already have a mayor and a city council. And you can see this at every point that D.C. residents get close to getting that vote in Congress, whether it's in the late 1970s. Uh, when we were able to pass a D.C. Voting Rights Amendment, which would have amended the Constitution to allow us two senators and a voting representative. The main opponent of that legislation was Jesse Helms, uh, the racist from North Carolina, who flat out said on the floor of the Congress, this is just a way to pander to black people, as though voting is a way to pander to anyone in a democracy, right? Um, and then in 1980, the entire GOP es essentially adopts Jesse, Jack, Jesse Helms's idea, which is that they're going to diametrically oppose any effort to give D.C. a vote in uh, Congress. And that's because new right activists, people like Phyllis Schlafly and Pat Buchanan and Ronald Reagan, take over the party in that year. And they effectively start to say at that point, um, the GOP will focus on making sure that D.C. doesn't get any vote in Congress, whether it's through an amendment, whether it's through statehood, whether it's through a simple piece of legislation that just gives our non-voting delegate a vote in the House. We're going to oppose all of it. And they've done that from 1980 all the way down to the present. They've done it for two reasons, and I, I should outline them here because we're talking about race. Um, one is that D.C. is a uh, overwhelmingly majority Democratic city, where roughly uh, nine of ten voters are Democrats. Part of that, by the way, is because the GOP has so poorly mistreated the city in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Um, there were not that many Democrats in the city back in the 1970s when the GOP was more neutral towards us. Um, and over uh, sort of sort of underlying that is the fact that the vast majority of African-Americans, not just in D.C., but in the country, are Democrats. And so there's a sort of a racial overlay to our partisan divide. Um, if you look across the country, Easily nine in 10 African-Americans are Democrats. D.C. is a plura plurality African-American city. And when you look at the opposition to D.C. statehood or D.C. or, or vote for our non-voting delegate or an amendment for D.C., there's a very clear racial undertone to that opposition. Um, and, and I can go into the details, but I'm going to stop here. I think I've talked too long. The basic idea is that race and partisanship are deeply entwined in opposition to uh, a vote for, uh, D for uh, uh, in Congress for D.C. over the past 40 to 50 years. You said a couple of things that were really interesting in there about the it's sort of the difference between partisanship and and politics to uh, the reminder that, you know, the Republican Party of uh, initially sort of was this party that um, of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and mm -hmm. so when we talk about something like D.C. statehood or talk about the right to vote, we're not talking about a partisan issue. We are talking about an issue that is caught up in politics um, and, and these days has sort of turned itself into a partisan issue. Um, and, and it's really interesting to think about the overlay that, that race has um, uh, in this issue and, and voting rights. 
Um, and I just wanted to like pull that forward a little bit, uh, you know, for the folks who are, who are watching us, um, because I think it's an important point and, and a point that we hear a lot about like, oh, well, this is a really partisan issue and, and it, it really shouldn't be. Uh, and and can, I, can I just add one thing? Because for most of the 20th century, the vast majority of champions of a vote, not just a vote for president, not just a vote for local government, but a vote in Congress for D.C. were Republicans. Ed Brooke, the senator from Massachusetts, Republican, um, was a co-sponsor of the D.C. Voting Rights Amendment. Um, there, you know, there's a gentleman from um, uh, South Dakota named Chase, who for much of the, the early 20th century was the key person in the Senate who was pushing a, a vote for D.C. in that chamber. Um, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, was actually instrumental in bringing the vote back to the district in the 1950s when he allowed us to vote in party primaries, not in general elections, but party primaries, um, and called on the Congress to give us a vote across the board uh, in the chamber. Um, so, so Republicans have been key to, the, to what little democracy we have been able to get, except for in about the last um, 40 years, unfortunately. And so... Turning to you, Andrea, this, you know, there's a lot going on in voting rights. And as executive director of the ACLU of Georgia, you've really seen the impact of voter suppression firsthand. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what you've seen and fought against in Georgia and sort of what parallels you see between what's happening in your state and what is happening in the District of Columbia? So um, Derek would not be surprised to see that the first word uh, in my notes is race. Uh, that, you know, democracy, this notion of who is an American, who is entitled to participate in our democracy, you know, has always been racial, right? And, you know, in the South, um, uh, African Americans were used to give uh, uh, voting representation, but not receive an actual vote. So the three fifths clause, for the purposes of the census, which we're in now, uh, gave Southern states, um, you know, disproportionate uh, gave you know disproportionate um, numbers in terms of who's in the legislature and so forth, without actually allowing uh, those same people to cast ballots. And so that's still the mentality we we sort of are all confronted with this notion that the South lost the war and won the peace. Uh, and so we have not only the um, racialization of voting in the South, but we see that now, you know, across the country uh, as there's this rush to voter suppression. And again, I kind of hear this echo of what Derek is saying is that, well, if we would rather no one vote if Black people get to vote. Uh, and that seems to be the position the Georgia legislature has now taken, because after 5 million people voted in our, in our 2020 election, under rules created by, by the Republican-controlled legislature, the governor, uh, the, our current governor had also been Secretary of State for eight years. There's not been a Democrat um, you know, statewide controlling election since 2007. Uh, so these were their rules, uh, but they didn't like the results. And so the re so as a, as a result, we've had um, a complete redo, rewriting of Georgia's uh, election code. The Secretary of State was stripped of power to oversee elections, the, uh, the election board. The uh, legislature, uh, controlled by very extreme right-wing Republicans, uh, gave itself the power to uh, relieve any county election official of their uh, of their role uh, and they're in the process now of trying to take uh, take down the uh, the election official that rep that works in Fulton County which is where the city of Atlanta is which again is a, 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 a jurisdiction where African Americans have political dominance um, and they saw this happen around Metro Atlanta that uh, counties surrounding Metro Atlanta, uh, all elected uh, county officials, uh, sheriffs, district attorneys who are African-American. 
So they're responding not only to the presidential election, but also this increase in Black political electoral power that happened uh, in the 2020 election. Uh, one of the ironies of uh, you know, DC is a baseball town. Um, I think we just traded uh, games back and forth last weekend, but um, you know the irony of the of the of the All Star Game being moved out of Atlanta and moved to um, uh, Colorado is that the county where the stadium is right now just elected an African American woman as county commissioner, an African American sheriff who ran on a reform. Uh, platform and an African American district attorney who ran on a reform platform. Um, so this is all about race. It's all about a, this voter suppression. It's all about a reaction to African Americans voting, voting policies that favor uh, their communities, that uplift the values of African American communities, and in fact, a majority of Georgians, in fact. Uh, Georgia is now 45% people of color in terms of its um, voting age population. Uh, and so again, you have a, like DC, you know, you have a state that's like at a tipping point uh, in terms of the electoral power of people of color. Um, but it's very, you know, this is what we're seeing is very much the sort of resurgence of the politics you know, of the Confederacy. I mean, DC was an easy drive from Mount Vernon. Um, and so this is very much this sort of like our, a democracy only for uh, big landowners uh, and defending their ability to own people. That's what the Confederacy was about. Uh, and kind of still see this, um, this this ethic, this uh, the, these these principles of the Confederacy, you know, as people talk about voting, as people talk about this voter suppression, as you hear uh, people in the Senate and in, and in the House uh, op oppose uh, the duly elected electors that were sent from many states, um, you know, this it it all comes back to race and the role that race continues to play in our politics and the role that people are willing to undermine the principles of democracy uh, to keep black people uh, from participating fully in democracy. I just, as, as you were talking, Andrea, um, you know, I was thinking about the fact that Americans have sort of sometimes historical amnesia, like we forget our, our history rather quickly. And yet, what you're talking about seems like we, certain folks have taken a page out of the history books. When Derek was talking about, they wanted to make sure that folks couldn't vote in DC for anything, even dog catcher, right? And it seems like you're you're saying that that model is now sort of like being tested out again to just suppress the vote for everybody. Um, um, but But the reason being race. Yeah. I think, I mean, Heather McGee, you know, in her recent book talks about, the Some of Us, I think, talks about, you know, eliminating public pools, you know, um, this, this whole, this, this, and, and, you know, and how destructive and distorting white supremacy is of the things that we claim to value. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our, our, our battles, you know, have, are rooted in this drive to treat people, to treat black people. I mean, it's really rooted very much in anti-blackness, making sure that black people are treated as a substratum of society, which is a quote from the, um, you know, some of the Confederate folks, you know, defending the, uh, George Stevens, I think is, who has a, uh, Alexander Stevens, who had a, um, statue in the um, in the rotunda in, in the Capitol. Um, but we, you know, we really are going through this racial reckoning. And I think the raising these issues of DC is really important. You know, anti-urbanism is also part of it. You know, that somehow a city is not a real place. Atlanta deals with this. Atlanta is the economic engine for the entire Southeast. Um, and yet the narrative is that somehow Atlanta is a drag um, on the rest of the state when with the reverse and, and, the, and the sort of narrative, the cities are somehow 
a drag on the on the um, national economy when in fact when you look at where uh, where there is an imbalance in terms of what taxes people pay versus what they receive and benefits, it's these rural areas, it's rural Kentucky, it's, Al it's rural Alabama. The cities are net um, contributors to, to the, the national economy. Uh, and so there's this, this whole distortion of facts when it comes to race and when it comes to um, the truth you know, about who we are, who the contributing members of this society are, what our urban areas contribute to our national um, prosperity, um, not to mention, you know, uh, education and, you know, uh, you know, and so forth. But, you know, as, but there is this sort of anti-urbanism, which again is a, is, is this theme from the, that lives on from the Confederacy. That somehow you know you saw in the movie in, in the in the um, in the play Hamilton you know that somehow New York is bad you know but rural Virginia is good you know it's this um, this anti urbanism that that goes back and has only gotten more and more intensified as urban and has come to be seen as a code for um, black. And so um, I want to give Jamal a, a chance to, to jump in here. I have lots of <laughs> follow-up questions here for our conversation. But um, Jamal, you've grown up in D.C. Uh, you're a, a Washingtonian through and through. Um, can you talk about how the lack of statehood has and continues to affect you and, and the impact you see it having uh, in your community? Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> the, I mean, the lack of statehood was born out of the moral stain of slavery and persists through desperate political games that we see today to suppress black and brown political power and progress. Uh, and, and truly, we can no longer let politics overpower the will of people. Uh, and, I, and I always like to say for me the the fight for D.C. statehood, it, it's personal. Uh, it's it's rooted into the reasons why I'm, I'm a part of this fight is because in when I was growing up as a young advocate who wanted to advocate for quality health care, uh, a quality of life, quality education, and all those things that impacted my community, a majority black and brown community, um, it was it was uh, upsetting to me where in 2014, uh, there was a huge, a huge conversation around the Affordable Care Act and, and giving American families the basic opportunity to have health insurance. Uh, giving people like my mom, uh, my sisters and my siblings and my family to have the basic right to walk into a hospital and get treatment, to have the basic right to get preventative care covered. Uh, and the family that comes from uh, that comes from a background that that, 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 that battles uh, cancer, breast cancer and lung cancer often. Uh, and that was important for me. That was important for my family. And I wanted to advocate for that. Uh, and when the call to action from President Obama was call your senator. Uh, to ensure that these provisions were passed uh, through the through Congress, that's where my where I knew my advocacy ended at the mayor's office. That reaching out to my shadow senator, um, I realized I lived in the shadows of democracy. Uh, uh, but the the history of DC's disenfranchisement is is tied to racism and subjugation. And where you have DC residents that have lacked representation in Congress uh, since the passage of the Organic Act in eighteen oh one. Uh, which placed the district under congressional control uh, and stripped their representation from Congress. Uh, and the momentum, the momentum for DC electoral representation first really gained traction uh, during the civil rights movement. Uh, but at the time, that was primarily because DC was 65% white and, and it was fairly even split when it came when the uh, when it was in terms of party. Uh, and it and it gave both parties and both races uh, an incentive to to enfranchise its residents. But as you've seen over the years, enfranchisement stopped at 1970 when D.C. was becoming more and more black. We were called Chocolate City because we were 70 percent black. Uh, so that proves that disenfranchisement of D.C. is, is clearly racism in, in the effort to minimize black power, black political power. And, and history has shown us that uh, at a point in time in our history, uh, we saw a piece of Washington, D.C., which is now Alexandria, Virginia, split off because the white people said we want to continue to trade enslaved people we want to continue to 
uh, have voting rights in our democracy. Uh, um, so this has always been rooted into racism, the sub subjugation. And I think the, the, the power of the moment now uh, is that we're, we're seeing a, a fight from, uh, from, all, from all ends of our country, uh, that there are Americans all across the country saying that, th that, that this is wrong, that there are American citizens who live in our nation's capital who do not have voting representation. And that's as blatantly and as bluntly you can put it, that there are American citizens who pay federal taxes who do not get an opportunity to have a say in their government. And if we're going to live up to the ideals of what our government aspired to be and what our democracy aspired to be, then we have to live up to those ideals of, of, of giving D.C. residents their voter representation. I think, you know, some of the things that, that you said are so important and sort of nuanced, and I want to pull some of it forward, like, a lot of folks don't know that, you know, we have a fully functioning government, uh, like many states. You know, you said that your advocacy ends at the mayor, uh, you know, and, and D.C. sort of passes our own laws. Uh, we have our own budget. And the congressional intervention is just to put like things like riders on our budget so we can't spend money to implement laws or they can directly legislate on us. And, and this feels like a myth that is out there that, you know, con Congress is actually controlling D.C. when when it's not that way. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jamal? Yeah, I mean, D.C. is operating on a 17 billion dollar budget, uh, majority of which that budget comes from locally raised taxes. And, and, and that's a larger budget than a few other states uh, and, and, and a lot of cities. Uh, and, and, and we have balanced our budget and balanced our books for years and, 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 and passed uh, and shown we have a AAA bond rate. And not, none of that stuff matters, but it matters when people say that we aren't fiscally responsible uh, when we continue to see a surplus in our city's budget. And in fact, when DC becomes a state, uh, uh, we'll get the opportunity to, to provide more and more resources to our residents. It's projected that we'll get uh, uh, more than $2 billion in, in revenue to serve our residents. Um, but it, it's truly, it's truly suppression. Uh, when you're advocating as a, as a young black male like me uh, for local issues, when I see my, my peers and, and, and people I went to school with get slain to gun violence and we're advocating here locally uh, for, for, for stricter gun control laws and, and, and gun violence preventions. And you got these laws that are going to Congress for approval from a senator or a congressional member who doesn't even live here. Uh, right now we're talking that there, there, there's bills and conversation in our Congress that's about uh, limiting what our schools can teach uh, when, it, when we were talking about race uh, and when we're talking about um, uh, our country's history. No other city jurisdiction or place is, 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 uh, is subjected to that type of scrutiny. And, and, and it's a problem where we're advocating for these local laws. We're funding these local laws through our local budget. Uh, but we have to have a check and balance on those local laws that we're advocating for from someone else. And in fact, we have to hand deliver those laws uh, to, these, to these folks to approve what we're doing right here in the District of Columbia. D.C. has been the model a progressive model for many other states across the country, being one of the first places to legalize marijuana, uh, being one of the first places to, 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 to stand out front uh, when, it, when we're talking about same same sex marriage. Uh, when we're talking about um, when we're talking about uh, uh, using local dollars to support women's reproductive rights, D.C. have always been on the forefront. Gun violence prevention measures. DC have always been has been on the forefront on addressing these issues head on because that's what DC values are and that's what DC residents want. Uh, but the problem is you got a, a Congress that controls everything that we do and, and we we don't have an opportunity to have a voice of our own. It's really interesting the the sort of coded language since we're talking about race here and you know Andrea said earlier uh, you know that. Uh, being being black in America or or a person specifically black in America was not being human, right? Um, and there's something sort of a continuation of, um, you know, being patronizing of, well, you can't take care of yourself. So even though we have, as a city um, that was once known as Chocolate City, uh, balanced our budget for years, passed laws, <laughs> raised taxes, done all of these things that we need 
we sort of need this oversight uh, in order to, to run um, and that we can't have that voice because we need to be watched over. Um, can you tell? And it's really, if yeah. I, can, Monica, I mean, it's really something from an advocacy standpoint that people who live in cities all over the country should really want DC to have two senators because it would correct some of the imbalance of not having urban issues represented in the Senate. Um, so all, a lot of our cities face this, Atlanta faces it, uh, Birmingham, New Orleans, you know, Houston, Dallas, you know, we face sort of being in a state where, you know, conservatives, right-wingers run against the city. That's part of, and so the urban, urban issues just even though we are the engines of opportunity cities are the engines of creativity and productivity um cities do not get their due in our senate yep. and if i can add to that i mean it, it to bring it back to like racism and, and subjugation when you look at the history of how many states became a state it was it was about race and power uh it was we're only going to add this free state to the union if we add another slave state or when you talk about new mexico or or hawaii becoming a state it was their populations were too indigenous or the culture didn't fit to the united states but it was primarily because those cultures were majority people of color that they didn't want to admit those states into the union and we're seeing the same thing with dc right now is that it's always been about power and, and uh, a power grab for republicans um and I don't, I don't want to make this a Democrat Republican thing because it's not. Uh, but when we talk about that, when DC becomes a state that it's just a power grab, well, history has shown us that the real power grab is when Republicans decided to add uh, uh, six new states to the union when they were adding North Dakota and South Dakota and splitting territories and states to ensure that the power and the amount of senators balanced the amount of uh, Democratic senators uh, in the, in the Senate during the time. Uh, but that's the power grab. What this is about now is enfranchising black and brown people, uh, uh, American citizens who do not have voting uh, voting rights. And that's simple. So when people come back and say, well, how about we split Texas into two or California into two? Well, they already have voting rights. We don't. Uh, and I think that's what we need to start shifting the conversation uh, to talk about. It's really it's really interesting that you you talked about the power grab here. Uh, Jamal, because I, I think recently, uh, I think it was like Eastern Oregon and uh, Western Idaho sort of banded together and said, oh, we should make a new state, uh, which is unconstitutional because you can't make a new state out of another state, uh, which is why DC statehood is actually constitutional. We're not doing that. Um, but it is because of what you point out, uh, Andrea, that it's sort of anti-urbanism uh, and the sprawl of, you know, the, the urban city of Boise out and um, this sort of conservative model of, well, we don't want that to happen here. So we'll just sort of break off and have our own state in order to, to do that. Um, Jamal, before I, I come off of you, uh, will you tell us a little bit about your work with 51 for 51? But I mean, I, I work with 5151. We know the only thing standing between more than 700,000 people and the rights and privileges of statehood is an arcane Senate loophole known as the filibuster, uh, which was a favorite weapon of seg seg uh, segregationists uh, and continues to be employed to block um, necessary progress for our communities today. And that's what 51 for 51 is about. Uh, we, said, we said two years ago that we were gonna start this campaign to make DC the 51st state with 51 votes in the Senate and that we were not gonna let that that uh, that two by segregationists block us from reaching true progress. Uh, and, and what we've seen in our, again, in our country's history, that we said that if uh, 51 votes was enough for Mitch McConnell to confirm three Supreme Court justices, then it should be enough to confirm democracy and give 700,000 plus residents uh, their voting rights in Congress. Uh, and that's what we're fighting for. Uh, we cannot let this Jim Crow relic uh, stop us from reaching um, the vote uh, for people in Washington, D.C. And I, I mean, voting is so important. Um, and I, I'm going to kick this one to Andrea, because I, I remember, Andrea, when you joined the ACLU and you said, 
here's what we're going to do in Georgia voting that that's our priority. And, and so, uh, which, you know, we're a multi-issue organization. <laughs> we work on lots and lots of things, but you said you had this clear vision of voting is the thing. Can you explain why voting is so important, um, particularly in the context of race, but, but overall and, and why we should have uh, this as a, a priority, not only for Georgia and other states, but, you know, here in, in DC as well? Well, you know, Dr. King said, give us the ballot, right? And so the whole point is that if particularly, you know, African-Americans coming out of that civil rights tradition had the ballot, then we can do these other things. You know, we can do criminal justice reform. We can do inclusive education. We can do, you know, diversity programs. We can do, we can integrate our economy and create more op opportunity for, for, for everyone. And so, you know, if we have the ballot, then we can do the things that the majority of people actually want. And that's supposed to be what democracy is about. Uh, and instead, you know, we've spent 50 years, um, I think 56 years ago, uh, August 6th, Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. And so we have spent 56 years fighting for the full right to vote, for full access uh, to the ballot. And, um, but that's why it's so, you know, I said all the issues that the ACLU cares about are things that the majority of Georgians support, but they are not represented by people um, who will promote criminal justice reform, who will promote uh, health care access for all, who will fund our public education system. Um, and so, you know, the best way to get to those uh, who will protect freedom of speech, the best way to get to those values, at least in our state, uh, is through the ballot box, uh, because that's what a majority of people actually want. And they demonstrate that when it, when, in 2020, when they had an opportunity to cast a ballot um, these are the kinds of policies that people voted for all across the state of Georgia, not just in Atlanta, but in Savannah, in Augusta, in Macon, you know, um, in Douglas County, Georgia, uh, in Athens, where we elected the first Puerto Rican woman uh, to, to be a district attorney anywhere in the country. Uh, and so the values of the majority of citizens in our state are very clear. And, it, and that is why this massive voter suppression effort uh, is necessary to keep people, to, to prevent this, these kinds of policies from being, you know, what we see in a state like Georgia. Um, and so, you know, that's why, you know, the vote, and, and so the same would be true, you know, for DC is that these progressive values are consistent. Uh, people have a vision of a multicultural democracy. And so that's, you know, a lot of what I talk now about what's really at stake in our country is if we're going to be a democracy, we will be a multicultural democracy. Um, and so that's what ca calls this sort of race question really, you know, to account because the opposition uh, is opposed to a multicultural democracy that reflects the values and, and you know, and sort of panders to this myth of a white America. I, I've started since the 1619 project, I've started saying, listen, I am a ninth generation American. My family spent five generations experiencing slavery. Another four in generations experiencing Jim Crow segregation, including me. Uh, and so, you know, we, you know, you don't get any more American than this. And we have been fighting for the right to vote that, you know, that entire time. So, you know, this question of who is an American is so is really front and center and you know the residents of the district of columbia which i which i include my daughter and granddaughter were born in the district of columbia so i have a particular concern about you know voting rights and, and the full you know full democracy uh in the district of columbia uh you know is a, a cause near and dear you know to my heart um but it's you know it's all about are we really a democracy and are we going to live you know, as Dr. King always said, you know, be true. Will America be true to its creed that all people are created equal? And it's, you know, it's really that simple and clear. Well, and, and 
Professor Musgrove, I, I want to, like Andrea keeps talking about, you know, this um, sort of what it means to be American. Uh, and, you know, you're, you're doing a project here in the District of Columbia that is just, it's fascinating to me. So I, you know, would imagine has some links to how we sort of define American here in the District of Columbia and uh, give you a little space to talk about uh, your project about mapping black power here in the district. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that the, um, the project is finished. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's at a website called Black Power in uh, dc.umbc.edu. And I encourage everyone to check it out if they're, they're interested. Um, what I love about that project, though, to bring it back to the, the conversation of statehood, is that it's really uh, during the Black Power movement um, that district residents, both black and white, um, begin to seriously consider statehood. And the reason that they're doing that is because they, they see the different paths before them for regaining the ballot. Um, they see the possibility of just home rule, which is what we have now. Uh, the possibility of a constitutional amendment, which would give us representation in Congress as though we were a state, but still have Congress sort of oversee the city. Uh, and then they saw the option of statehood. And what they realized with all of those options short of statehood uh, was that members of Congress, many of whom uh, did not mean the city well, uh, pardon me, uh, members of Congress, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's someone at my front door. Um, I'm going to ignore them for a moment and keep going. Um, so what they understood, though, was that members of Congress, uh, many of whom did not uh, mean the city well, uh, were going to be able, with anything short of statehood, uh, to implement their ideas in the city. Uh, and so specifically in 1969, when many activists began embracing statehood, they knew that members of Congress from as far away as Kentucky were demanding that the city build miles and miles of highways. There was actually a plan to give D.C. the most highway miles of any American city, period. And D.C. residents didn't want it. They were in the streets lying down in front of bulldozers, actually, uh, uh, you know, they started a brawl at a city council meeting once. Um, they did not want these highways. And with anything short of statehood, Congress would be able to force those highways down their throats. Uh, and so you saw from that kernel of realization during that moment that people needed the autonomy uh, that statehood brought. Uh, and so they, that, that, that realization is spread across the population to where today, in our most recent vote in 2016, 80 plus percent of D.C. residents have uh, supported the call for statehood and have been working for it uh, ever since. And so, so the hope is that just like Wyoming, which has only half a million residents, uh, just like some other states that have fewer residents in D.C. or roughly the same amount, that we get those same uh, uh, representation in our national legislature that they do, which is two senators and based on our population, a member of the House of Representatives, and and just to pull, just to sort of pull out, just to pull out one point that Andrea made just a moment ago, which I think is terribly important, and, and that is that just think, if the effort to suppress votes in Georgia, uh, put forward by Brian Kemp and some of his uh, co-conspirators, had actually failed, had actually succeeded, right? Um, we would be looking at a Senate that had a Republican majority and the ability to stop pretty much anything uh, put forward in the Biden agenda. Um, things like, you know, expanding the ACA uh, infrastructure. Uh, we could go on and on. Andrea, you look like you want to jump in here. Well, no, I was just thinking, I mean, because we do think about what happened with uh, January 6th, for example, you know, one of the things that delayed our response is that the mayor, that the District of Columbia cannot call up, does not, cannot call up the National Guard without permission of the federal government. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the, and, and, and we also saw a lot of instances where, um, you know, MAGA crowds would be dispersed through neighborhoods in the District of Columbia. I know, Monica, this is one of the things that we talked about. Uh, and so I remember this, I remember the effort to sort of carve out 
the District of Columbia and separate that, you know, from what would be the state. Um, so that, you know, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about this sort of constant, what we went through in terms of the protecting the constitutional requirement to have a District of Columbia. Um, and, but then also to preserve and protect the citizens of the district from some of the things that do happen, you know, in the sort of federal part of the city. I mean, there are things, um, but I remember when there was a big MAGA rally and people were dispersed through the black neighborhoods of Washington, D.C. And these were, you know, anti-black white supremacists with, you know, Confederate flags and like no real concern being given uh, apparently by the Park Service um, for what this, what people like this would mean in our in, in the neighborhoods in the district. So there are, um, you know, there are a lot of concerns that, uh, you know, that, that, that we have. Yeah. It, it's really interesting as you bring up sort of January 6th to be watching sort of these hearings. Um, and for a lot of us here in D.C., we can't even, you know, really watch these hearings because we sort of lived through the trauma very recently. Um, and what a lot of people don't um, realize about January 6th is here in the District of Columbia, um, you know, in the actual city that 700,000 people live in, in their daily lives and go to work and have their children and, and things like that. Um, on the streets, we had Proud Boys and white supremacists fighting with black activists for days leading up to January 6th. So this was not a, you know, the fact that this was about to happen um, and the energy here in the city was very laden with race. Um, and when you look at who rushed the Capitol on January 6th, um, you cannot help but talk about race. And yet you you see from even the clips of the hearings in Congress, once again, um, you know, there is no mention really that, that this was, you know, it's sort of a race free event. Um, and we have to talk about what people were trying to stop, which gets lost in all of this is that, you know, the, the counting and verification of the electoral college votes uh, in a voting election of the nation of national importance, um, and so I think you know uh, that in and of itself sort of harkens all the way back <laughs> to <laughs> Professor Musgrove's comments at the very beginning of you know if if black folk in this country are going to have uh, the right to vote, if we are going to suppress it, then we should just suppress it for for everyone. Um, so thank you, Andrea, for bringing up January 6th. Jamal, you look like you want to jump in there. Yeah, no, I do. Because, I, I mean, January 6th, is, it's going to go down in our history books. Um, and, and on January 6th, white supremacists descended not just on the U.S. Capitol, uh, but on, like you said, the neighborhoods that we all call home. Uh, our community was left vulnerable to violence of hate uh, and then called to clean up the mess uh, because we lack the protection of statehood. Uh, and one of the very triggering things that for me to watch the news that day was the lack of regard to D.C. residents and, 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 and how we bore that brunt on that day. Uh, and, and in the Washington Post article that I wrote, um, op-ed that I wrote, um, it, it was many things that were being missed out of the dialogue and conversation. And that wasn't just the fact that we didn't have a National Guard to call in right away. Uh, because our mayor didn't have the authority to do so, but it was the, the stain that it left on our communities and the people that it, it impacted. Uh, hourly wage workers who worked in the District of Columbia were forced to go home early because grocery stores were closed, restaurants were closed early. Uh, and, and, and even in that same vein, many of them couldn't even get home because the transportation had to be cut early because these white supremacists were storming our streets and storming our public transit systems. Uh, so we had to close all the things early and disrupt the day-to-day -day lives of D.C. residents uh, uh, um, to protect democracy on that day. Uh, and, and that day for me was also personal. Uh, my grandmother, my late grandmother, was battling cancer. Uh, and, and she depended on her home health aid to visit her uh, and ensure that she was getting the necessary um, uh, uh, health 
aid and, and everything required for her to have on that day. Uh, and she couldn't do that. She couldn't come into the city to provide that aid. Um, but the, the, the January 6th taught us was, was that the entrenched systems of white supremacy protected the men and women that committed treason on that day. Uh, and for over 200 years, these same racist acts uh, um, has affected our institution. It has disenfranchised the majority of black and brown people right here in D.C. Uh, who live in the heart of our government. Um, so the, the fact on that day that all I saw was what it meant for the National Guard uh, rather than what it meant for D.C. residents to just be a state. Uh, it, it, it was it was it clearly showed us the disregard that our country has towards uh, their American citizens right here in the District of Columbia. I really um, I'm I'm glad you brought up this very personal sort of story, Jamal, because I, I think sometimes in this conversation, um, you know, ab about uh, the history of racism in our country and about voting, which can seem like an, an idea of America, um, what gets lost is the real sort of impact on people's lives and the things that we are talking about that are so important that we do have a voice in when it comes to criminal justice reform and health care and, and all of these things. And that the fact is, is that that mess of cleaning up that mess um, and the impact of that one day was actually felt for uh, you know, weeks after, as we had, you know, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of military forces in our city that caused people to actually leave the city um, because it, it basically became occupied um, and, and felt like a war zone uh, for a while here in the District of Columbia. Um, and so these things, you know, are very important um, in a place where we don't even have um, you know, Professor Musgrove said earlier that the autonomy, right, which is, is ultimately an American ideal of individual freedoms to have the autonomy to make decisions for ourselves. And in a representational government, um, it, we rely on the vote and that representation in Congress in order, in order to live out that ideal. Um, so I want to offer a couple of minutes uh, here at the end for everyone, if you have a, a few parting thoughts, and I'll, I'll start with you, Professor Musgrove. Well, I'll, I'll just say that, that, you know, one thing I think that's important to, to get to the membership is that um, there are a couple of arguments out there against D.C. statehood that are really red herrings. And so I just want to address some of them. Jamal brought up one of them earlier. And, and that is that, uh, you know, folks will say, well, the whole reason we have a federal government that's outside of a state is because of the mutiny of 1783. And for those who know the story that, you know, there were essentially a bunch of war for independence soldiers who marched on the state house at Philadelphia um, in order to demand back pay because they were not paid by the, the Continental Congress. Uh, they just they, they stiffed them essentially because they didn't have any money. Um, and so those soldiers marched on the state house, and everyone seems to think that they went there to go and harass the members of the Continental Congress. They didn't. They went there on a Saturday when they knew the Continental Congress was not meeting because they knew the Cong Continental Congress, one, had no money, and two, had already told them that they weren't going to pay them. So they went to essentially go and petition the Philadelphia state legislature for money because they knew that they actually had tax revenue. Um, but the story has been passed down to us is we have to have a, um, a Congress that's outside of a state because these soldiers went and threatened members of Congress and the state refused to come and help. And that's simply not what happened. It's, it's not true. It's ahistorical. And what is crazy to me is not only do opponents of statehood make that argument today, not knowing the history, but then what they'll also say is, yeah, and on January 6th, we really needed the capital to be outside of a state to defend it from the mobs. And they'd also throw in the summer protests uh, around George Floyd. And the fact of the matter is there again, they ignore the history, right? Because who was it that defended the capital against the mob? Well, it was the MPD called in by the Capitol police, the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia. Um, 
And so, you know, in both instances, when they talk about the security of Congress and the security of the presidency, they're reading the history wrong from, 18, from 1783 and from 2020 and 2021. It's embarrassing. Um, the other thing I'll say is that people will say, well, D.C. doesn't have enough people to be a state. But in fact, we have more people than two states. Um, not only that, but D.C. Pay, DC residents pay more taxes per capita than residents of any state. Um, and so there really isn't a good case against D.C. statehood other than um, we have power and we don't want to share it with you. And that is un-American. Thank you for that. And uh, Jamal, do you want to say any final words, anything on your mind? Yeah, I mean, as John Lewis once said that uh, our, our vote is precious, it's almost sacred. Uh, and, and that means a lot. And that holds true to what our democracy is. And I'm going to just put it as, as bluntly as possible. We're currently at a crossroads in our democracy where the next four years is going to decide the next 40 years of our democracy. We're at 200, uh, about 200 uh, to 250 years old. Many democracies don't last this long. And, and, and truth be told, we have to be the model and example for what a democracy looks like. Uh, um, and, and if we aren't getting it right over the next four years, it will truly define who we are over the next 40 years. And, and I say that because that's the urgency of this moment and that's the urgency of now. Uh, and if we don't correct this stain on our democracy, not just DC statehood, but voting rights uh, in general, uh, if we don't correct the stain on our democracy, then we're gonna go in the direction that we don't wanna go in as a country. Um, so we can't continue to count our days where there are people right here in our nation's capital and people all across the country who lack voter representation, where there are majority black and brown people across the country who lack voter representation. Um, and, and we need to pass meaningful legislation now, and that includes DC statehood. Thank you for that. And Andrea, any final parting thoughts? Well, I, you know, again, August 6th was the 56th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so, you know, this is this is a long struggle and it's a struggle about principle. And that's one of the things I really love about the ACLU is that we look and fight for principle, not power. Uh, but what are the principles that should govern, uh, you know, our democracy, which uh, we are, as we say, trying to create a more perfect union, um, you know, but so much of what we have heard uh, and what we also know to be true about our struggle today to fight voter suppression is that it's based on a lie. Um, and so there's the big lie, you know, about what happened in 2020, you know, and, you know, um, Derek and, you know, Jamal, you know, shared with us, I mean, things that people continue to say that simply are not true, that misrepresent the reality. Um, and so one of the things that uh, Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the Voting Rights Act was that you cannot live with a lie and not be stained by it. Uh, and so this lie that somehow African Americans are not Americans, that we're not uh, an integral part of this democracy, that you can have democracy without multiculturalism, um, that you can have democracy and deprive uh, the citizens of the District of Columbia of, uh, of participation um, these things are simply not true. So we have to say that we, you know, we are committed uh, to creating a more perfect union. We are committed uh, to a multicultural democracy, and we are committed to making America live up uh, to the highest principles uh, on which it was founded. Thank, thank you. And thanks to all of you for participating on this panel. Um, I want to thank all of our watchers of this wonderful webinar, um, shout out voter suppression, racial injustice, and the fight for DC statehood. As a reminder uh, to crib from Andrea's quote, uh, to lift this stain of the lie that DC cannot be a state, uh, it requires all of you in your states contacting your congressional members and letting them know uh, that you care about this issue, that you care about the residents of the District of Columbia, and that uh, we should have voting representation uh, in our government. So once again, thank you to all the panelists um, for participating in, in today's event.
Thank you.